How many of you remember the year 1227? Yeah, yeah, you do. A lot of you do. Okay. I know. It's your favorite year, 1227. You probably don't remember that year. Probably not one that you remember. You have in your phone somewhere. Remember 1227. But it's an important year when it comes to the Bible. I see a couple heads nodding. There's a couple people in here actually know their Bible that are actually like, hey, 1227. A man named Stephen Langton. It was the first time we actually had chapters in the Bible. So before 1227, there were not chapters in the Bible or verses. Can you imagine trying to read the Bible without chapters and verses? So you should all write Stephen Langton a thank you. No, I'm just kidding. But from 1227 on, we had chapters and verses. And what's so important about that is when you're reading the Bible, sometimes... Not all the time, but sometimes when you go from one chapter to the next, you think that a whole new idea has started, right? That's not always the case. We just read chapter 4 in Matthew. It wasn't like chapter 3 happened, and then a year later, and then now we have chapter 4, okay? (laughs) It's actually a continuation. Chapter 3 goes right into chapter 4. So it's, it's good to understand what's happening in chapter 3, especially at the end of chapter 3, as we get into chapter 4. Because if you remember, the very first word of verse 1 in chapter 4 was then, insinuating that something happened before that. Then this happened, okay? So we need to understand what happened in chapter 3 for then the author to say, well, then this happened after that. Well, what happened at the very end of chapter 3? Jesus was baptized. Extremely important. All four Gospels have the baptism of Jesus in all four Gospels. Let me just submit to you this. That if it's in all four of the Gospels, it's pretty important. Right? (laughs) Why is that? Why is the baptism of Jesus so important? Why is baptism important? Because baptism is when you and I, those of that have have been baptized, we're receiving and declaring our identification. That I am not who I used to be. The old me is gone. There is a new me. The old me is dead. But the new me is alive. And we see in Matthew 3, verse 17, And a voice came from heaven and said, This is my dearly son who brings me Great joy. God speaking as Jesus came up out of the water. This is my son. I love him so much. He brings me great joy. And here's good news for somebody in this room. At this point in Jesus' life, he had done nothing. No miracles. Preached no sermons. Healed no one. And God said, this is the one I love. It brings me great joy. So you might have walked in here today and said, I've done nothing for God. How can he love me? Listen, you don't earn his love. That's not how God works. God loves you just the fact that you are, you, you're the apple of his eye. He knows every hair on your head. He is crazy about you and he pursues you. But it's so important for us to know who we are. We have to know our identity. Why? Because chapter 4 is coming. Chapter 3 is important. you got to know who you are. But guess what? Chapter 4 is coming. In fact, Mark says in his gospel that as soon as Jesus got baptized and he came up out of that water, the word he uses, immediately he was taken out into the wilderness. Immediately. I checked the Greek. You know what immediately means? Immediately. like that. It reminds me of of this this water situation that we have, going into the water, coming out of the water, and then taken to the wilderness. It reminds me of the Israelites in Exodus, right? They were being delivered. What they get delivered through? The Red Sea, through the water. God used water to save them. Did he take them to the promised land, the very next thing? No, immediately they went into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, they got tested. And then some of them got to the promised land. 
So some of us think as Christians, I get baptized and I just go to the promised land. That's not what Christianity is, friends. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trials. You will have troubles. You will have many trials, Peter said. Many, many in this life. So our baptism is where we receive our identification so then we can then go out into the wilderness and actually stand firm against the trials and storms and temptations of this world. Amen. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. But as he got into the wilderness, he was going to pray and fast and get ready for his ministry. But guess who was waiting in the wilderness? Satan. The Bible tells us that Satan prowls around like a lion. He's not a lion, but he prowls around waiting for you to, to be at an opportune moment when you have your defenses down, when you're hungry, when you're tired, when you're angry, when you're frustrated. <laughs> he wants to recruit you and renew your mind the opposite direction than what the Holy Spirit wants to do. It reminds me that I have to make sure that when I come to church on Sunday morning and I worship, I know that when I go back out of here on Monday, I'm going to the wilderness, right? Some of you need to stand firm and understand I come in on Sunday and I worship, but I know and I expect that I'm going to the wilderness, and guess who's waiting for me in the wilderness? But I'm not afraid. Because he's been defeated, right? My God has defeated death, hell, and the grave. So I don't walk in the wilderness like, ooh, what am I going to do? No, you need to understand and I need to understand that every day as a Christian is a daily battle for your faithfulness. It's a battle for your faithfulness to Jesus. See, Satan will attack your faith so you won't be faithful. Satan will attack your faith, what you actually believe and what you're actually walking out and you profess that you believe. He will attack that so you won't be faithful. Why? Why? Because the most important thing you can do as a Christian is trust God and actually walk out your calling. Actually walk into the purpose and plan that God has for you. When you do that, you defeat the devil. And Satan doesn't want you to do that. He doesn't want you to be faithful to God. Oh, but he wants you to be faithful to him. And so that's how he wants to renew your mind the opposite direction. So you'll be faithful in the wrong things. (laughs) Oh, but how does he do that? He can't force you to be faithful to him. Like if Satan showed up here today and said, listen, I want to destroy your life. Just follow me. You'd go, yeah, you're an idiot. Like, I'm not going to do that, right? No, no, that's not how it works. I'll just give you one word. This is how he does it. Temptation. 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 Comes to you in your weakest moments. Even in your quiet time. You ever tried to have a quiet time with the Lord and you just, you just can't stay focused? Why is that? Because he knows if you can get along with the Lord, ooh, you are hard to deal with after that. <laughs> but you have a choice. See, see, here's what temptation is not. Temptation is not sin. Let's, make, let's be very clear about it. Temptation is not sin. Hebrews 4.15 This high priest of ours, he understands, talking about Jesus. Jesus understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings that we do. Yet he didn't sin. So Jesus was tempted, but he didn't give in to it. He didn't sin. He resisted it, so then we can resist it. But I want you to know this. Temptation is the precursor to sin. It's where it starts, right? Every time that you've sinned in your life, you were tempted before you sinned, right? And every temptation is pointing you towards the things of the world. First John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 says this, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you, like money, other people's opinions. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, not satisfaction, just a craving. A craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from this world. See, temptation is always going to come in the form of money, 
position, sex, lust, pride, envy, to tempt you into sin and be faithful in the wrong things. So temptation, it's not sin, but it leads to sin. Temptation is common to all, number two. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The temptations in your life, they're no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. You don't have to give in to sin. Here's the good news, number three, about temptation. Jesus helps us. Jesus helps us. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Since he, Jesus himself, has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. So there is a way out. The Holy Spirit will give us the power and the direction and the wisdom. When you're in the middle of temptation, you know you're going to experience temptation, but there is a way out to stay faithful. So I want to show you typical tactics of temptation that the enemy uses. Let me just give you the main thing here. This is what the enemy does. His number one way he tempts you. It's not always as obvious, so please write this down and don't you forget this. That what the enemy wants you to do, is wants, he wants you to question what you actually know is true. He wants you to question what you previously thought was true, what you understood was truth, and wants you to question that. We see it all the way back in Genesis. Did God really say you couldn't eat from that tree? Did he really say that? I mean, did he really mean that? I mean, nobody's going to know if you pull your phone out and look at porn right now. You're not hurting anybody. Right? Nobody's going to see you go over there and flirt with that person. Like, it's, not, it's really not, it's not that big of a deal. Everybody does it. And so what the enemy wants you to do is add to the word of God, subtract from the word of God, or edit the word of God, right? So you can have your cake and eat it too, right? Can't do that. Not biblical. Satan tried this with Jesus. So guess what? He's going to try it with you too. Let's look at these tactics. Number one, what he'll try to do is get you to question God's provision in your life. Question God's provision. Will God actually provide for me? Is he really Jehovah Jireh in my life? And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, we we'll read it again. During that time, the devil came and said to Jesus, if, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. <laughs> By the way, a better way to translate this word if here is since. I know this translation says if. Some of your Bibles say if, but a better translation is since. He's already been baptized. He knows who he is. What he's saying is since you are the Son of God, if that's what you are, then why don't you turn these stones into bread then? You're so powerful. You just, God just came down and, and called you the Son that I love. Well, why don't you just, why don't you just do this? Right? You're hungry. You've been, you've been fasting for so long. See, it's a discreet way the enemy will try to get us to doubt God's ability to, to provide for us and get us to want to go fix things instead of wait on the Lord. And so the temptation is this, to get you to behave impulsively instead of responsibly. To get you to be behave impulsively, just have an impulse. And let me say something. I know it's hard when you're hungry, when you're tired, when you're exhausted, when you're being emotional, to not be impulsive. But when you act impulsively, you are not acting with logic. You're acting based on your emotions and the circumstance and the situation that's in front of you. But see, when we, when we respond instead of acting impulsively when we respond, when we back up and take a breath and go, wait a minute, before I act on this, this situation, based on my emotions, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm hurt, I'm whatever, I back up for a second. And I respond based on truth. I don't make hasty decisions because I'm offended. 
we make the right decisions. So the first thing the enemy will do, I want you, I want you to question God's provision. Can God really provide for me? Maybe I should just go do, do this. I'll just impulsively go change this. My plan's probably better than God's anyways, is what the enemy wants you to do. The second thing is get you to question God's protection. Question God's protection. Does he really care about me enough to protect me? Matthew 4, verse 5 and 6. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he'll order his angels to protect you. And they'll hold you up with their hands so you, don't, you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. So just throw yourself. It's going to be okay. I want you to understand in this particular moment, Satan quotes Psalm 91. So you can be like, well, I know scripture. So does Satan. Yeah. But what is Satan doing here? It's a discreet way to get us to doubt God's love. Ah, you know what? You probably need to test that out to see if he really loves you. Like, why don't you throw yourself down there? We'll, ju we'll just see if God really loves you. Because you know he really doesn't. You know if God called you to go do this, he probably won't even show up and help you. I know that pastor said he'll resource you and there's resources in your relationships. And if God called you to something, he'll resource you for it. But don't believe that. If God called you to it, he's going to leave you out there all by yourself. And you're going to have to figure it out on your own. So you better test God. So here's the temptation. Testing if God really loves me. I don't really truly trust that God loves me, so I better test him in that. <laughs> and what Satan's kind of saying to Jesus and what he really wants to say to you and me is to get in our brains and us to say, well, I mean, well, well since, since you are a Christian, you can just do whatever you want to do, right? Just God's got grace for you, right? There's grace, so you can just do whatever you want to do. He'll forgive you. He'll protect you. There's no consequences to your sin and your bad decisions. I've actually had atheist, an atheist person say this to me one time. They're like, I don't like God. Okay, how come? Well, he's got all these rules. Okay, well then what, what do you like instead? Well, I like Satan. Why do you like Satan? He lets me do whatever I want. I said, okay, uh, you're wrong. Because what Satan wants you to do is what he wants you to do. You see the difference? See, you're following one or the other, right? You can't, don't, let your, don't let your mind be deceived thinking there's more freedom with Satan. In fact, his freedom is right here. This is what he wants you to do. Just sin, mess up your life. God's freedom is wide, right? There's so many things he wants you to do in your life. And we see it the flip way. And that's what the enemy wants. He wants you to think, God is only going to let me do this. And Satan's going to let me do all these things. Right? <laughs> that's deception. Right? Don't be deceived. So he wants to, you to question God's protection. Number three, question God's promise. Question God's promise that he has for us. Matthew 4, verse 8 and 9. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory. He said, I will give it to you, all of it, if you'll kneel down and worship me, if you'll just bow down. So in this particular case, and the, now sometimes the devil will do this, he won't be as discreet, he'll just be real blunt about it. If you'll just kneel down to me, I'll speed things up. God's promise is taking too long. Just step right over here, friend. I've got door number two for you right here. And we'll just speed this thing up. Oh, it'll get you somewhere close to where God was wanting to get you, I'm sure. You don't like waiting, do you? Isn't that boring, waiting on God? Yeah, I mean, if he's making you wait that long, does he really love you? Don't you know yourself better than God does? Do you see how this works? See how the deception works? 
And the temptation, if you start to give into this, you start to, you start to question the promise of God on your life, what the temptation is, is to covet other things and other things that people have. You get impatient because you're looking around at other people and seeing they're getting the promise that God had for their life, but I'm not getting what I thought God was going to promise me, and that's not fair. And then you're not content. And maybe everything that you have in front of you right now is exactly what you need, you need to do, exactly what God has called you to do, if you'll just be content and not covet what other people have. And so when we start to covet other people's things and their lives and their husbands and their wives and whatever it is they're calling, we start to covet those things and we're not content, we'll choose the easy way out. We'll become impatient and we'll act in haste. So here's what temptation is. Temptation is an opportunity to prove faithfulness. Temptation is an opportunity for you and I as Christians to prove faithfulness individually and corporately, right? For you, whenever God has spoken something over you, you stay focused on that, and the devil's going to try to tempt you, and he's like, no, I'm going to stay faithful. And us as a church, that God has called us to shake the grounds of southeast Missouri, and we stay focused on that, and we don't give in to temptation to go off this way or try to give in to culture or whatever that is, right? We stay focused. We stay faithful. So since we all face temptation in our life, we all face temptation every day, what are we supposed to do? We have the habits of Jesus, right? I want to show you four major disciplines of Christ that will actually lead you into a life of faithfulness. Four major habits of Jesus that will lead you into a life of faithfulness. Number one is this, prayer. Prayer. Jesus was extremely Faithful in prayer. I don't have time to list out all the scripture of Jesus getting away to go and pray, but here's three quick ones. Luke 5, 16, Matthew 14, 23, Mark 1, 35. Just to give you three quick ones. Jesus, on a regular basis, got away from the crowds and got in solitude and prayed. Most scholars believe in this Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus was led into the wilderness was going to be a prayer retreat. <laughs> but temptation came too. <laughs> I need you to understand there's a difference between solitude and isolation. You know that? See, solitude is when I want to get away and get alone with the Lord. He and I we are going to spend some time together. Isolation is when I walk away from the Lord and God's people and God's word. And so what the enemy wants to do is try to interrupt your solitude to bring isolation. You see that? So just because you're going to get along with the Lord, don't think he's not going to come mess with you, right? <laughs> well, I'm just going to go pray. That way the enemy can't bother me while I'm praying. <laughs> Why does the enemy attack prayer? Let me give you three reasons. Number one, prayer is communication with the Lord. Why does he want to interrupt that? Because that's when I receive revelation from God, right? Of course he doesn't want you to have revelation from God, right? Number two, prayer strengthens my relationship with God. Of course he wants to attack that. The more I'm praying with God and communing with him, I'm connected stronger with him. And the third thing, prayer brings perspective, right? The more faithful I am in praying, the more I see things the way that God sees them. Like Jesus did in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. Let me give you two wrong ways to pray. Oh, okay, now don't elbow anybody. Here's two wrong ways. Number one, when you pray to be noticed by people. Jesus was pretty critical about people that did this. Out in front of people, oh Lord, my life is so hard. Oh, bless me, Lord. The second way that's wrong to pray is to pray to be noticed by God. Right. Uh, God, um, did, you, did you see I just prayed? Did you see that? I just spent five whole minutes in prayer. Did you see that? So the new car I was wanting, like that, I thought if I prayed for five, ten, ten, you mean do ten? The car didn't happen yesterday. It was five not long enough. Like, like we don't pray to manipulate God. It doesn't work that way, Right? <laughs> 
Here's three ways you should pray. Pray privately, expectantly, and relationally. If you pray privately, you'll be okay with praying publicly the right way. Find you a place at home and pray privately on a regular basis. Pray expectantly. Expecting, what's that? I'm expecting God to speak to me as I'm praying to him. I'll be quiet. I'm not just going, blah, 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 me the whole time. I expect him to speak to me, to align my heart to his heart. And relationally, when I pray with God, I want you all to know this. Like, we're having a conversation. It's not, the old powerful one, thou. Well, if you speak like that, that's okay. But I don't, I don't speak that kind of English, right? We just talk, right? Privately, expectantly, relationally, prayer. Jesus was faithful in prayer. Number two, Jesus was faithful in fasting. Fasting. Matthew 4, verse 2. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. And some of you would be hangry after that. What is fasting? Fasting is not a diet. It's not a diet. And fasting is not a way for you to manipulate God. Write down Isaiah 58 if you want to understand what fasting really is. Let me put it to you this way. Fasting is me removing something in my life, abstaining from that, and replacing it with solitude time with the Lord, right? It's sacrificing a selfish desire in exchange for spiritual growth is what fasting is. Right? Let me give you three, three times when you actually really need to make sure that you're fasting. Now, you can fast at other times too, but these three areas I see a lot of Christians don't fast in these three areas. Number one when you're getting ready to make a big, big decision. Anytime you feel like you're getting ready to, to toe up to a big decision in your life, I would give you the advice to fast. How long do you need to fast? I don't know. You pray about it, God will show you. I always want to fast before any kind of big decision because I want to make sure that my motives are right and that my motives are pure and that God is directing my path, not me, Right? The second time I think it's really good to fast is when you're mourning, when you're grieving, when you've gone through a loss, when you're upset, when you're sad. Fast. Get alone with the Lord. Pray. He'll speak to you and give you direction. Oftentimes when we're really sad and angry, we can make really bad decisions. Right? So fasting while we're mourning. And the last one is when you're repenting. When you've had conviction because you know you're doing something wrong. You know you're not living the life that God has called you to live. And you decide, I've got to repent. I suggest you fast. Get alone with the Lord. Repent while you're fasting. And he will speak to you. The ways he wants you to change. The things he wants you to cut out. The new things he wants to put in through fasting. It's amazing. It's amazing the clarity you can get by fasting. The third thing is the word. I don't know if you noticed this, but as the devil was tempting Jesus, he responded continuously, it is written. It is written. It is written. Why? Because the word of God is a weapon. See, when we get baptized, the word comes over us and we receive our identity. But when we're in the wilderness, we must take the word with us into the wilderness. Right? Right? And I want you to know this today. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a continuous attack on the Word of God every single day in our culture in America. It's not political. It's biblical. I am so tired of people telling me, you need to stop talking about politics from the pulpit. I will talk about biblical items from this pulpit to my last breath, right? I will talk about what the Bible says about marriage. I will talk about what the Bible says about sexuality and gender, that there are two, right? I will talk about morality. We will talk about truth. This is what the Bible says. See, our culture has a very, very low value on Scripture. And look at our culture. Look at it. (laughs) 
So what do we do? Do we stick our head in the sand? No. Do we get our phones out and fight? No. You got to know the word. You got to know it to use it. (sighs) There are no excuses for any Christian to not be in the word. No excuses. Get out your addiction device. I mean your cell phone. Get out your thing. And you look on there and tell me the apps you spend the most time on. You have plenty of time. I'm making sure everybody sees me real quick. I'm looking at me too. You have plenty of time to get into the Word. It's not a time thing. It's a heart thing is what it is, right? If you knew you were being attacked every day, you would prepare yourself by getting in the Word. It's a weapon. Mm. I will move on. The primary reason the enemy wants to pervert the scriptures and deceive people is ultimately he wants to be worshipped, number four. We'll end with this. The enemy wants to be worshipped. That's why he doesn't want you praying. He don't want you fasting. He don't want you in that word, right? Don't want you to know truth about who God is and how much he loves you and how he's got a plan for you. Because you wouldn't listen to him if you did all that, right? We see this in Matthew 4, verse 8 and 9. Next, the devil took him to the peak of the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Verse 9, I will give it all to you, he said, if you'll just kneel down and if you'll just worship me. What's he saying? If you will give me the highest worth in your life. See, the temptation is for us to bow down and value people and their opinions and things, and material things, and homes, and cars, and money, and the culture above God. For us to worship creation over creator. How do you know what you worship? What do you focus on? Look at your focus. What do you think about mostly? That's what you worship. See, as Christians, we got to understand that our focus and our eyes need to be fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And when we put that word in our heart and we're praying and we're fasting, we can take our worship into the wilderness, right? That was the problem with the Israelites. They didn't bring their worship into the wilderness. We can't be like that. We must bring our worship into the wilderness. So why does Satan attack your faithfulness? Why? Why does he attack your faithfulness? Why does he tempt you away from praying, from fasting, from getting in the word and worshiping him? Why is that? I'm going to put it to you this way. The attack on your faithfulness is an attack on your calling. The attack on your faithfulness is an attack on the call of God on your life. And this is why he tries to get you to question who you are. Right? Because if you'll question your identity in Christ, you'll question your calling. And you'll try to create some other identity and some other calling that God did not call you to do. Let me tell you something. If you don't think you're under attack today, you will not prepare for the attack. You won't pray. You won't fast. You won't get into the word. You won't take your worship in the wilderness. I'm telling you, some of you in here today, as I went to those four, you're like, I don't do any of those because you don't think you're being attacked. You don't think you're being deceived. And see, that's the scary part about deception. deception. You don't realize you're being deceived in the middle of it. I've come here today to wake somebody up that you are being deceived. You're like, well, the devil doesn't really bother me. Exactly. You're being deceived. See, if you're following Jesus, it's temptation and attack, but you push it back. Prayer, fasting, the word, and worship. Why? Because I know who I am. I know 
who I am. And I don't say that pompously. I don't say that arrogantly, right? Because I only know who I am because of what he did for me. I get my identity from him. But for me to stay faithful, I got to know who I am. You got to know who you are. See, when our identity is firmly established in Christ, we are enabled to be faithful. It's only when your identity is firmly established in Christ. Is your identity firmly established in Christ? Do you know how to declare who you are in Christ from A to Z? Do you know how to declare the truth about what God says, who he says you are from A to Z? I do. I am adopted. I am accepted. I am blessed. I am born again. I am created in his image. I am chosen. I am a child of God. I am dead to sin. I am destined for heaven. I am elected by God. I am forgiven. I am free. I am gifted. I am holy. I'm identified by God. I'm justified by God. I'm known by him. I'm led by the spirit. I'm living by faith. I'm loved by him. I am made righteous by God. I'm a member of the body of Christ. I am new. I am not condemned. I'm on his mind. I'm a peacemaker. I'm protected. I'm purposed. I'm quiet in spirit. That's why I have a peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm redeemed. I'm rescued. I'm ransomed. I'm remembered. I'm restored. I'm saved. I'm sealed. I'm sanctified. I'm transformed. I'm treasured. I'm unashamed. I'm united. I'm victorious. I'm washed. I'm a worshiper. I'm exonerated. Yes, that started with an E, but you try to find a word that starts with an X. <laughs> I am yoked with God. He, does, he comes beside me and does the work for me, and I am headed to Zion. I'm headed to heaven. I know who I am. That's why I can be faithful. If you don't know who you are, you are deceived. And there's somebody who walked in here today. You are sick and tired of confusion. You are sick and tired of walking a life that you know God has not called you to live. You're unsatisfied. And you know it. Because all you're doing is going out and trying to get things from this world. Let me tell you, friend, it, those things will never, ever satisfy you. Ever. Ever. I have been there. Never satisfy you. You will come up dry. It's a drug. It's a drug. A drug with malnutrition in it. Those cravings that the devil wants you to have lead you dry and empty. And that's why you feel empty. That's why you have fear, anger, bitterness, greed, jealousy. In your heart, you need to be made new. Today needs to be your day. The word tells us you're one simple, sincere, heartfelt prayer away from being made new. The word says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, because he is, by the way, he is whether you confess it or not, but if you'll confess it today that he is Lord, you will be made new. The old will go away and the new will come. Tell you what, friends. <laughs> I thought I had to figure it out before I knew Jesus. I was doing what the world said. Checking off all the boxes. The world said do this, do that, do that. It looked really good on paper for the world. Empty. Empty. Lost. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I do pray that God spoke to you directly through his word, because his word is perfect. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for your word. There's nothing wrong with it. We don't need to edit it or change it. It's perfect. I pray, God, that whatever we heard today, that we would receive it and we go deep in our hearts. I pray, God, that you would change people, transform them from the inside out. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for watching this video. Click that subscribe button. we got more content coming out.